four years, for instance, to go to the healthy state, then another eight years to go to the, the death state. Um, so as I mentioned, there's lots of ways to fit multi-state models with R. Um, here's just some sample code in the case where we actually do have exact time to event. Um, you can use the, the FlexServe package, which is, is quite great for fitting parametric survival and multi-state models. Um, one way to do it is to fit essentially a different survival model for each possible transition. Uh, we had four in the reversible illness death model. You can also do joint models. Um, and the, really the key though to setting up the multi-state model is to make sure your data is set up in a proper way. Um, there's lots of resources online for that show how to do that. I, I recommend the FlexServe vignette, um, but that's really gonna be the key and I, I won't go into more detail here. As I mentioned in HESIM, you can either fit an explicit model like with FlexServe or you can create um, the transitions yourself kind of by hand. Um, so here, just for simplicity, we'll, we can look at three different possible transitions. Um, and you can see for each transition, we es essentially create an explicit survival model. Um, for the first two, healthy to sick, healthy to dead, uh, we'll use an exponential model. Um, for sick to death, we'll, we'll use a, a Weibull, proportional hazards Weibull model. Uh, we could use other parametric distributions. Um, so you're, you're quite flexible in the way that you can do that. So once you've parameterized the model, the next thing to think about is how you actually want to do prediction. Um, that is how you want to simulate your disease progression. In clock reset models, uh, you really need individual patient simulation to compute state probabilities in any sort of general fashion. Um, so that's typically what we would do. In a clock forward model, there are closed form expressions for computing state probabilities. Um, that said, individual patient simulation can work as well and still I think has some advantages. Essentially the way the individual level of models work are by simulating trajectories through the multi-state model using random number generation. So we kind of randomly simulate when patients transition between states and, and, the, and the states that they actually transition from into. With any individual level model, the, the purpose is really to compute expected values for the target population being simulated. Um, so we need to make sure we, we simulate a, a large enough number of patients um, so that we can average over them and, and get stable estimates. In the multi-state framework, um, the way an individual patient simulation works is essentially from, from any given health state, we would simulate times to all the all possible transitions. Um, and then the patient would actually transition to the state with the smallest sampled time. In clock reset models, this is actually quite straightforward um, because we can just sample from standard survival distributions. In the clock forward context, it's actually a little more complicated because we need to sample from truncated distributions um, because time doesn't reset. So, you know, for instance, if a patient gets to the sixth state at time two, we would randomly draw from a, a distribution truncated at time two, um, which just makes the kind of the computation a little more complex. Um, but let's, let's take a, a look at our clock reset example. So here a patient starts in the healthy state, um, they transition to the sixth state, or we sample transition to the sixth state, it takes three years, to death takes eight. So uh, they go to the sixth state first, so that's what would actually happen in the simulation. Um, we could also, next, we would sample time to death, time to healthy, because those are the competing health states. Um, death occurs first in the simulation. So essentially what we have is the patient transitions from the healthy to sixth state <clears throat> at year three, and then from the sick to death state at year seven. And we would repeat this process for all the patients within the simulation. So as I mentioned earlier, computational efficiency is an important consideration for us. And so essentially the way we try to make it fast, again, is we <clears throat> program the core code in C++, which <clears throat> essentially just means that we're vectorizing, uh, i.e. <clears throat> looping, 
over the treatment strategies, the patients, and the PSA iteration. So instead of looping at the R level, we, we loop at the C++ level. Um, in general, the simulation is quite fast if efficient random number generation functions have already been created. So this was true for most of the base R parametric distributions. Um, and it's also true if, if we can compute a closed form expression for the quantile function um, so that we can simulate using the inverse CDF method. And this will be true for, pretty, for all of the parametric distributions actually that are in, in our HESIN package. Um, in some cases, this is impossible. So that's true with splines, with fractional polynomials. And in that case, simulation is slower. Um, but we, tried, we have two techniques that you can use. One is you can compute the quantile function numerically and then sample using the inverse CDF method. Uh, the other approach is a discrete time approximation where we kind of have a grid of survival probabilities. And then we sample times based on those probabilities from a, a Bernoulli distribution. I found that works a little bit better, but it means you've got to determine how fine of a grid you want. So there's a little bit of uh, the user kind of has to play around with it a bit. Another option is to kind of approximate these more flexible survival models with say like a piecewise exponential, which then gets you back into the, the parametric family. So how do you simulate disease progression with our, our HESIM package? Um, as I mentioned earlier, any model kind of has three submodels: the transition or disease model, and then cost and utility model. So you would start by creating a transition model. Um, again, it, it's, you can kind of think of it in like the machine learning framework where we have parameters. So we have our fitted Weibull model um, and then testing data. So that would give us information on the treatment strategies and patients that we want to simulate. And that goes in our input data. Um, we also would need to say what kind of multi-state model we have. So that's our TMAT or transition matrix. And that would sort of tell us what kind of model we have, which is like the reversible illness death model. In this case, uh, we'll do a, a thousand PSA iterations, um, or say the model's clock reset. And then you can also say the starting age of patients. Um, this is helpful because that way we can simulate to some sort of maximum age. So we can say patients can't live longer than 100 years, 120 years in the simulation. Um, and that's often needed because when you're doing random number generation, you'll sometimes get kind of funky values. You might have a patient living to 200 years um, just kind of by random chance. And then once we've done that, we actually set up an economic model, which again consists of the transition model, cost model, utility model. Here we'll just put in the transition model. And then we just run this sim disease function. Um, and it'll give us for every PSA sample treatment strategy and patient, the state they transitioned from and to the time they started the transition and the, the time they stopped the transition. Uh, we can also simulate costs and qualities from this disease output. Uh, we do it using the continuous time present value. Um, I think the main, uh, main thing to take away here is we can actually compute this with a closed form expression. Um, you see that on the right hand side, there, there's no integral that we have to compute numerically. So that makes it quite fast. Um, and the key is really the Z term. So those are the health states for, are the state values for, for each state H. And sort of like the disease model, they can be predicted from a statistical model or they can be predefined. You have a lot of flexibility. So they can vary by treatment strategy, by patient, or even for different time intervals. Um, this, the time interval point is, kind of also related to one of the advantages of individual level models, which is that it's not just disease progression that can be clock reset, actually your state values can be as well. Um, so one example that we've run into is an oncology where patients would tra will transition to a progressed state. And from there, we often assume that they switch treatment um, and they might switch to say like a chemotherapy. And often the chemotherapy costs vary over time because of differences in cycles or chemotherapy cycles. And you can really only do that in the individual level model. Um, the cohort model, you could kind of approximate it with tunnel states, but it's a little more burdensome. So how do you parameterize costs and qualities with HESIM? Um, there's many ways to do it. The simplest way is just to use a special object we have called the state val table. And here we just apply um, means and standard errors for the two non-death health states in our model, um, states one and two, the healthy and sick states. And since we're gonna focus on utility, we'll use a beta distribution for our, our PSA. 
Um, if you wanted to, as I mentioned before, you could make this more flexible. So these could vary by patients. They could also vary by treatment strategies and or time. Once you um, have your utilities and costs set up in this way, you then can go ahead to create your full economic model. So you would create a utility model from those parameters. You would do the same thing for costs. And then the full economic model would consist of the transition model we created earlier, and then your utility and cost models. Um, so previously, we, we did simulate disease progression. Um, so once we've done that, we could simulate costs and qualities. And we just have these simple sim qualities and sim cost functions. And we can set flexible discount rates. Um, so we'll, you know, we can do without it with no discount rate, the kind of the standard 3%. And we'll do that here. And then once you've simulated cost and qualities, we also have uh, some integrated functions for performing cost effectiveness analysis. Um, our qualities and costs would sort of like disease progression would be simulated at the individual level. So we'd have values for every treatment strategy and patients and PSA duration. So then to perform CEA, we want to summarize those or kind of get means across the patients. So that's what the summarize function would do. And then from there, we have two types of cost effectiveness functions. One is the, the standard CEA, which will look at all the treatment strategies sort of simultaneously. But then we also have the CEA pairwise function, which will compare um, all the strategies to like a, a given comparator to get pairwise comparisons. Um, again, as I mentioned, computational efficiency was important to us. Uh, we have run some speed tests so far. Uh, one thing that we did was compare our individual level simulation to a, another function in M-State called MS sample. Um, we used a, a six-state model uh, and we used a Weibull distribution. Um, we have a link to a blog post where, where we did this. And Running a thousand patients in HESIM and a hundred PS iterations, HESIM actually took 0.44 seconds. Um, M state took 34 minutes, so quite a bit longer. We did, at least on my machine, we did. We then up up to a thousand PS iterations. Um, HESIM took five seconds in this case. I actually didn't run it for M state. Um, it would be like a probably an overnight operation. We also compared HESIM to HEMOD. Um, we used an individual level model for HESIM with 1,000 patients. For HEMOD, we used a cohort model, um, 60 annual cycles. In the HEMOD case, we compared two treatment strategies, so pretty small model. Um, and we used the time and homogeneous hip replacement Markov model from the Briggs uh, decision modeling textbook. And for the 1,000 PSA iterations, HESIM was nine seconds, um, and HEMOD was 85 seconds. So actually, the individual level model from HESIM was faster. And we could also run an equivalent cohort model with HESIM, which, which took about one second. So just to, to summarize, uh, at least in my view, semi-Markov models are, are very nice because of their flexibility and ability to track patient history. Uh, that is, hazards, costs, utility can all depend on time in the health state, uh, not just on, on model time. Uh, again, they can only be really simulated in a general manner with individual level simulation. I think for the most part, or to a large degree, you simply kind of eliminate some concerns about slow run times. It's also nice because after you've simulated disease progression, you can use it to simulate costs and qualities um, and to directly perform CEA. That said, there's still a lot of stuff we'd like to do, new features we'd wanna add. I think maybe one of the ones that's next on the list, um, we wanna have ability to update covariates during the individual level model. So this could be useful, for instance, with a, a clock reset model, if you're simulating times to death with piecewise exponential distributions, um, you might want to be able to update your age as the simulation goes by um, to directly adjusting the covariates. So that's probably next on our agenda. Um, another thing, we've talked about integration with multi-state network meta-analysis. So that's another thing that we're working on. Um, and kind of once we've got, got that working, we, we'd like to integrate the code so that it works natively with, with HESIM. And then finally, maybe for even more computational efficiency, we, we've I've talk, thought a little bit about parallel computing, although it's a little more complex uh, with the C++ code than just at the R level. Um, and then finally, you can always uh, see full examples um, on, our, on our website for HESIM. 
see new updates or if there's bugs you find or new features that you'd like to be added, you can um, post issues on GitHub. And so thank you so much. And if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to, to take them now. Thanks very much, Stephen. That's very, very interesting. Um, I think there have been a few questions. So there's one, uh, uh, more of a, well, um, so when you were talking about different software that can run the different bits of the model. So um, I made a comment that I thought uh, any of the Bayesian softwares you had there, so Jargs, Bargs, or Stun, can actually run through all of the different sort of models that you were uh, presenting. And somebody in the chat says um, they're not the package to run the estimation, they're just the platform for the Bayesian analysis. Um, and to run STAN, you would need to, to do your specific own code. And, uh, and then again, I, I've responded that I think you can integrate STAN, for example, uh, from different packages that allow you to have more or less the same format, um, like uh, BRMS or, or, or others. So is the question my thoughts on that? If you have any, but it was more of an exchange within the chat, really. Oh, I, I see. I mean, I would I would completely agree with that. I know you've done work with uh, your serve he package, mm -hmm. which kind of does something similar. Which uh, it, it is true you... that you know, depending on the complexity of the model, you might want to trade the flexibility of this software, these procedures, with the complexity of running parts of the code separately. Um, which is, you know, it depends on the trade-off that you want to put on, on, on doing things this way, I think. Yeah, I mean, if you want a fully flexible model, then you can code it from scratch with, say, Stan. But for most cases in, like, multi-state modeling, you probably at least want to start with the off-the-shelf software that exists. And there was another question, which is, can the Z values, the cost and the qualities be dependent on time in state? So no longer a closed form. Uh, yeah, so we, that's kind of the last bullet point here, which is that the cost can themselves vary by time in, in the state. Um, but it's, we still treat it as a closed form because we essentially just compute costs for each time interval separately and then aggregate over them. So it, it's still computationally efficient to compute, but it's also flexible. And then the final question, do you have any plans to add DES models to Um, I think that's probably beyond scope. Um, to me, DES is where you start having things like queuing um, things that are a little bit beyond just mm. kind of the simulation structure that I had. And I would say, yeah, probably your best bet is to use something like Simmer that, that's really designed specifically for, for DES. Um, if you don't care about queuing and you just want to kind of sample continuous time from in continuous time times to health states, then you could use HESIM. But I wouldn't consider that like true DES. Fair enough. Uh, is there any more questions? I, I think that it um, sort of exhausts what was in the chat so far, I think. I guess one other question would be whether or not you want to add agent-based simulation, like to allow interactions between your individuals, especially given all the excitement we've had this year. If you want no, to put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> that is, uh, yeah, excitement this year, one way to put it. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I would have to, I think, think about how complex that would be. Because my sense is once you start adding interactions, um, stuff gets a lot more complex. And then I'm not sure how you would interface uh, what the user kind of does at the R level to what's going behind the scenes, uh, like under the hood. But yeah, it would certainly be very interesting to add if, if it's feasible. I think it goes back to the point you were making earlier on that, you know, again, there's a trade off between having something that is a platform that is fully sort of usable in most cases and something that goes deeper in the complexity of the modeling that you have. And that probably isn't something that you can code once and for all and always use because you would need to adjust for the specifics of your problem. Yeah, I mean, my sense, like if I was doing it, I would probably just code a custom model from scratch. Um, yeah. And we like 
I mean, obviously I know my own code base well, but we also have like essentially a C++ library that lives under the hood, which could be leveraged. Um, but yeah, I think it'd be easier to, to code it from scratch at this point. Okay, thanks very much, Devin. 